But we begin with a key question. Is the UN Security Council deadlocked? Russia looks set to veto a US-led resolution calling for humanitarian pauses, Moscow wanting nothing short of a full ceasefire, and Israel's ambassador to the UN wants UN chief Antonio Guterres to resign. This following Guterres' comments where he condemned the terror attacks by Hamas but also urged an end to what he described as the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. There were heated exchanges at the UN Security Council meeting in New York. As the war in Gaza rages on, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned that the situation was growing more dire by the hour. He repeated his condemnation of the Hamas terror attacks and reiterated his call for humanitarian ceasefire. It is important to also recognize the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. But the grievances of the Palestinian people cannot justify the appalling attacks by Hamas, and those appalling attacks cannot justify the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. The relentless bombardment of Gaza by Israeli forces, the level of civilian casualties, and the wholesale destruction of neighborhoods continue to mount and are deeply alarming. And Israeli this, Foreign Minister Eli Cohen no responded angrily to the comments. To Secretary General, in what world do you live? Definitely, this is not our world. He later cancelled his meeting with Guterres. Israel's ambassador to the UN went a step further. The UN is failing and you, Mr. Secretary General, have lost all morality and impartiality. I think that the Secretary General must resign. Outside UNHQ, relatives of some of the hostages held a rally. They laid pairs of shoes to show solidarity with the hostages. Later, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken asked the Security Council to back a new US-led resolution which called for humanitarian pauses but not a ceasefire. However, Russia said it would veto anything short of a full ceasefire. So with the UN now in deadlock, a diplomatic solution to the crisis seems a very distant prospect. German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock addressed the UN Security Council as well, saying that Israel's security is non-negotiable, but stressing that the fight should be against Hamas and not civilians. The fight is against Hamas and not against civilians. That is, why, that is why it's crucial for us that this fight must be carried out in line with humanitarian law, with the greatest possible consideration for civilians in Gaza. That is why my country, Germany, is increasing our humanitarian aid to Gaza by 50 million Europe, of which 19 million go to UNRWA. That is why we need humanitarian windows so that those who are suffering can get help in Gaza. That call for humanitarian windows and an increase in aid coming even as Berlin says its place is by the side of Israel. We asked our political correspondent Emily Gordin how much of a challenge that diplomatic balancing act is for Germany. Well, I mean, it's been doing that from the very beginning. I mean, Baerbock has repeatedly called on um, the, and, and has emphasised the importance of humanitarian aid as well as the protection of civilians. Um, but, of course, she says that it takes two to tango when it comes to that. Um, humanitarian aid can't be delivered if Hamas continues to attack Israel from Gaza, um, because ultimately Israel does have the, the right to defend itself. Um, and when it comes to this humanitarian aspect, I think that's played an important role from the very beginning. Um, as Western countries showed their solidarity with Israel in light of the heinous uh, terrorist attacks by Hamas, they've also said that, um, you know, Israel has to respond within the limits of international law. So it wasn't a blank check that was handed to Israel when it comes to that. And I mean, US President Joe Biden has also continuously advocated for um, restraint, drawing on his own experience after the 9-11 attacks. Um, and this line, this, this line of, you know, emphasizing also restraint is followed by Germany. It is, as you say, a very fine line, but um, that's, um, that's at the moment um, what Germany is advocating. 
um, protecting Israel's right to defend itself, while also highlighting that this is, of course, um, affecting hundreds, millions um, of civilians in Gaza. Those civilians have been seeking shelter as the Gaza Strip comes under heavy bombardment from Israeli forces targeting Hamas. It's led to many families having to make some heartbreaking decisions to ensure survival. Ali Daba has bought his family members string bracelets, one for each wrist. The bracelets are a way for Daba to recognize his children if the very worst happens to them. Grim reminders of Gaza's ongoing humanitarian catastrophe. Since the militant group Hamas's terror attacks on Israel this month, Gaza has been under siege. Airstrikes have demolished whole neighborhoods. Ali Daba and his wife decided the best thing to do was to split the family. He fled with some of his children to Khan Yunus in the southern Gaza Strip, while his wife remained in Gaza City further north with the rest. I told my wife to keep two of our boys and two of our girls with her in Gaza, and we came here to Khan Yunus. If we die, then at least they'll be alive. We put bracelets to mark each other just in case something happens. I've seen bodies ripped apart. You can't tell one from the other. If something happens and they're in pieces, this way I'll recognize them from the bracelets. Gaza is home to 2.3 million Palestinians. More than 1.4 million residents have fled their homes for temporary shelters, most of them heading south. When we were at Tal al-Hawa, we were terrified. It was a horrible sight. A mother and her daughters were inside a bathroom. The mother had been killed and the two daughters were alive. We were so scared and we couldn't even go to the bathroom. The Hamas-run health ministry claims nearly 5,800 Palestinians have been killed in Israeli bombing since the bloody incursion on October 7th, when Hamas militants attacked Israeli border communities and an open-air music festival. They killed more than 1,400 people and seized over 200 hostages, including elderly and disabled people. Israel responded with airstrikes and its forces are expected to launch a ground invasion set on destroying Hamas. The World Health Organization has called for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire to replenish food, medicines and fuel supplies in Gaza. So will that humanitarian ceasefire or a pause happen? My colleague Terry Martin asked a spokesperson of the Israeli Defense Forces. The IDF is continuing its strikes against Hamas. That is our mission, that is our goal at this time. I'm not aware of any plans to conduct a ceasefire okay. or, any need for, or any need for that at this time. Indeed, we're listening to the international actors and, and, and we are listening very carefully. But nevertheless, the time has come where Hamas has to go. I wanted to move on to, to something else. Uh, the question of safe areas are the, the, in the south, you, you, you referred to those. Uh, those areas are also being bombed. We have plenty of eyewitnesses um, uh, c confirm that. W what are you doing to assure that innocent civilians are, are not being killed uh, in those safe areas? So, cool. so I just received a report that in the humanitarian zone that we designated that a rocket had actually been fired out of that. So that poses the exact challenge we are facing. Do we not protect ourselves because Hamas is launching rockets behind civilians? Do we not protect our civilians? This is the dilemma. What we are mm. doing is trying to minimize the impact. We are targeting Hamas for sure. We will continue to pursue this terrorist organization that brutally massacred, maimed, uh, abducted uh, uh, over 1,400 people, 1,400 men, women, and children. When they dismembered, when they came in and penetrated our border, they signed their own destiny. They cannot be permitted to ever hold the power of government in Gaza again to launch such attacks against Israel. That is the situation. Unfortunately, it is the civilians of Gaza that have been let down miserably by this terrorist organization. It right. is their responsibility to try and uh, alleviate those issues it, it, on the humanitarian, but also on security. And Israel blames Iran for supporting Hamas. On Wednesday, Israel accused Iran of helping Hamas with intelligence sharing, amongst other things. Iran has repeatedly warned of wider repercussions against Israeli actions in Gaza, in line with the mood of antagonism in the Iranian government.
Iran's reaction to Hamas's deadly attack on Israel on October 7th. Lawmakers celebrate with chants, and on Tehran's streets, the Islamic Republic's supporters are singing the same tune. We Iranians should help the Palestinians a lot. If necessary, we should fight alongside them. It wasn't always this way. After the establishment of the State of Israel in May 1948, Iran maintained close ties, de facto recognizing the country. Everything changed when in 1979 the Tehran monarchy was toppled by the theocratic government of Ayatollah Khomeini as part of the Islamic Revolution. Viewing Israel as a threat to Islam, Iran's new government cut all diplomatic and commercial ties with Israel. It declared liberation of the Palestinian territories one of its main priorities, as well as the fight against Western influence across the Middle East. Part of this fight is Iran's involvement in creating Hezbollah, a Shia political party and militant organization in Lebanon in the early 1980s. The group continues to be closely aligned with the Iranian regime. It fired rockets at Israel hours after the recent Hamas terror attack. Israel and the U.S. have repeatedly claimed that Iran's support for Palestinians also led to the foundation of Hamas. While Iran denies directly assisting Hamas in its recent attacks, it has repeatedly warned Israel of consequences if the retaliatory strikes on Gaza continue. If this crime continues, Muslims and resistance forces will be impatient, and nobody will be able to stop them. The West must know this. They shouldn't expect some people to stop those groups from doing this or that. No one can stop them when they lose their patience. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has issued his own warning. I have a message to Iran and Hezbollah. Don't test us on the northern border. Don't get back to the mistakes that you did once, because today the price that you will pay will be much more expensive. The potential for nuclear war raises the stakes even higher. While Israel neither confirms nor denies having nuclear weapons, Iran says that its own nuclear program is peaceful and has blamed Israel for attacking its nuclear sites. Both countries have managed to avoid an all-out war for decades. But the recent escalation in the Middle East raises fears that this status quo could change. All right, let's get more context on Iran's role in the current situation in the region with Ali Fatullah Nejad. He's director of the think tank, the Center for Middle East and Global Order, based in Berlin. Mr. Fatullah Nejad, the Israeli military has just today accused Iran of helping Hamas with intelligence, intelligence sharing and ordering attacks from Tehran-backed militias in the region. Do you think this is setting the stage for a potential direct military confrontation between Iran and Israel? I think, I mean, first of all, it is clear that uh, not only the Islamic Republic of Iran, but also uh, Russia, by the way, are the main profiteers of this war between Hamas and Israel. And of course, Hamas has been, uh, you know, supported by Iran um, financially, logistically, in terms of military training. Um, and although uh, Iran is very much uh, interested in, uh, in abusing the situation, at the same time, there are concerns about a great war um, happening uh, in its wake, uh, that is between, one between Iran and Israel and probably also the United States. And in such a scenario, this would pose a tremendous challenge to regime security. So in other words, Tehran is interested in a conflict, but not necessarily in a great war. So Iran and Israel heading for war isn't a likely possibility in the near term? Well, uh, it is uh, definitely uh, hard to predict. Um, you know, it depends on the dynamics that are going to be unfolding. But what is important to understand is that, uh, as in the past, the red line for the Islamic Republic is a great war, is a uh, military confrontation with Israel, uh, mm -hmm. which is militarily much superior. And of course, the Islamic Republic also, um, you know, uh, calculates that uh, not only would it have to face Israel, but also 
the United States. So uh, there is a dilemma here for Tehran. While one is, you know, very much supportive of Hamas's operation, um, and um, it is, you know, one is also trying to uh, push away or to uh, deter Israel from uh, engaging in a military operation in Gaza that could endanger the operational capability of Hamas. At the same time, one is very much concerned about the Great War, uh, which is not in the interest of Iran because of the tremendous peril it would pose to regime security and stability. Does that mean that in the near term, therefore, we will see Iran continue to support its proxies in the region, not just Hamas, talking about Hezbollah, but also the proxies in Yemen, for example, from where missiles were fired, apparently towards Israel, missiles that a U.S. warship shot down. So should one be expecting more of this underground support for Iranian proxies in the region? Well, this is much more likely that Iran uh, uh, is activating its uh, so-called assets uh, within the uh, so-called axis of resistance in the Middle East, not only uh, from Yemen, but also pro-Iranian forces in Iraq and Syria could be activated. When it comes to the, uh, you know, the massive involvement or the potential massive involvement of Hezbollah, which is by far um, you know, the most uh, military capable uh, asset of Iran in the region. This is also not certain because of the, uh, you know, situation in which Lebanon finds itself in, uh, because Lebanon is in shambles. Uh, mm -hmm. It is facing a, an economic and political collapse and cannot afford another war uh, with Lebanon, uh, sorry, with Israel. So, um, for, you know, so this is also challenging when it comes to um, an, an involvement, an active involvement, much more that we've seen so far from Hezbollah's side. How much support and how much of an appetite is there among people in Iran for getting uh, directly or indirectly involved in any confrontation with Israel, given the poor state of the Iranian economy? Absolutely. It's not only the poor state of the Iranian economy, but also it's um, it, there's a lot of uh, you know frustration uh, from Iranian society vis-a-vis -vis the regime. We've seen revolutionary protests in Iran a, a year ago. Mm -hmm. So the regime is facing tremendous you know problems at home. Uh, but what we can observe is a tremendous gap between state and society when it comes to the issue of Israel-Palestine mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, you know, decades-long propaganda uh, from the Islamic Republic uh, about Israel and Palestine, uh, we can observe a, a societal backlash, a societal reaction uh, that is very much uh, identifying this kind of power play executed by the regime to abuse the Palestinian cause right. and to advance its own regime interests. So there is a, a strong societal opposition to the kind of narratives that Tehran is promoting. I would also like your views, sir, on how Saudi Arabia factors into the Iranian government's thinking, given that both countries agreed to restore ties earlier this year, and Saudi Arabia was very close to an agreement with Israel before the Hamas terror attack. Absolutely. And this is why I said at the very outset of our interview that Iran is a main uh, beneficiary of this uh, war because uh, the Hamas, Hamas's attack on uh, Israel and the war itself uh, has uh, de facto torpedoed the normalization process between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which has been a thorn in the flesh of the regime. It has considered a potential normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel as a veritable security threat. There have been a lot of, uh, you know, warnings directed against Saudi Arabia to pursue this path of normalization from Iran state media, uh, much more, right. you know, just uh, ahead of the October 7th uh, attacks. Mm -hmm. So uh, this has been, uh, for now, a foreign policy success uh, for both uh, Iran, but also Hamas, that has also been a very critical vis-a-vis -vis this uh, process uh, between mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia and Israel, because, uh, you know, uh, part of the discussion was that in the wake of such a process, the U.S. would grant a security guarantee to um, uh, Saudi Arabia, and such right. a security guarantee would 
it would actually put some important limitations to the kind of expansive regional policies that the Islamic Republic has been pursuing in the region. We'll leave it there for the time being. Thanks so much for joining us today. Ali Fatullah Nijad, thanks so much, sir. The Saudi deal with Israel has been put on ice, but what is the wider role of Saudi Arabia when it comes to relations between Israel and the Palestinians? Here's a report. Proof that Saudi-Israeli relations were being rebuilt. In September, this was the first ever Israeli ministerial visit to the Gulf Kingdom. A few days later, another Israeli minister's trip to Riyadh. The visits followed Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's address to the UN General Assembly in New York. He claimed peace between Saudi and Israel was close. But I believe that we are at the cusp of an even more dramatic breakthrough, an historic peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Saudi, though, knew that forging closer ties with Israel risked angering Palestinians. At the end of September, it sent its first delegation in three decades to the occupied West Bank. Its aim was to reassure Palestinians that the oil-rich kingdom still supported their fight for statehood. But on October the 7th, everything changed. The deadly terror attacks on Israeli soil by militant Islamist group Hamas have shaken the Middle East and the world. In retaliation, Israel has declared war on Hamas, which governs the Gaza Strip. Within days, reports emerged that Saudi Arabia was putting US-backed plans to normalize ties with Israel on hold. The Saudi government even held talks with its and Israel's arch enemy, Iran, one of the strongest supporters of Hamas. Analysts believe the Saudi crown prince is trying to de-escalate tensions in an increasingly volatile region while publicly supporting the Palestinians. It's painful as we gather here to see the escalating violence that Gaza is witnessing today, the price of which innocent civilians are paying. We affirm our rejection of targeting civilians in any way and the importance of sticking to international law and the necessity of stopping military operations against civilians and infrastructure. We want to create conditions to restore stability and achieve peace that ensures reaching a solution to establish a Palestinian state in a way that achieves security and prosperity for all. But at the moment, peace and stability seem a long way off. Improving relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel, just one of the many casualties.